Well, a very good morning to you. Uh, it's Sunday the 7th of February and you've uh, found yourself in the St John's Virtual Church. Uh, my name's Matthew, for those who don't know, and it's just lovely to sort of share uh, the good news that we we have in Jesus Christ with others around us. Uh, if you're new to us, then do make uh, do make contact, get in touch through uh, some of our emails. I'm pretty sure there are links there, there and there. Uh, and if you're regular, just a short message from me. Um, just thank you so much uh, for your generosity, uh, in par partly in the free shop, uh, which is helping uh, meet the needs of so many people in this crisis, uh, but also for your continued uh, giving uh, towards the mission of the church. It, it continues, even though the building uh, has closed uh, for now. And, and, and that's just a real privilege. And I just want to say thank you uh, for enabling us to continue uh, telling people uh, and about Jesus and sharing the kinds of love that he would share around us. So just a thank you for that. A couple of little bits of housekeeping. Uh, this evening's uh, prayer meeting, our monthly prayer meeting, uh, and Sarah and I will be looking at Psalm 40 and then praying uh, for the needs of the people around us and for the church and for the country. There is so much going on, um, but as we press through the book of Nehemiah, we'll find that prayer is really quite an important theme. Um, also, have a good chat with your house group leader about Lent, because uh, we'll have made some proposals about that, uh, and that would be really good. I, I would love to sort of just share some things through the through the course of Lent uh, 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 together as a whole church, and we'll work on uh, on what that might look like. And um, if you're touching base with us for the first time, um, really, really good to get to know you. We've got spaces left on our Alpha. It's only a couple of weeks in. It's easy to catch up. And we're starting to open that up out now to sort of ask more difficult questions, other things that are going on that affect us, other things that, other questions that we may have. So that's uh, really important to do. As we begin, uh, let's pray. Start with the, the words of Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, and make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Father, we thank you as we study the book of Nehemiah. It reminds us that you want to be with your people. And we pray that we would be the kind of people you want to be around. People who are turning to you, knowing who we are and how much you love us and forgive us. We pray that you'll be with us in all of our different households around the, uh, around the village and uh, around the area this morning. Pray that you would be with us uh, by your spirit as we come to your word and come to worship together. Amen. Well, I'm going to ask uh, Mike and the team have prepared for us. Great is the Lord. Oh, 
When we hear a, a song like that, we're reminded of how great uh, God is, and we can be reminded also sometimes of how lowly uh, we are. But we are trusting uh, that he came to us as we are uh, to call us to know him, to for, that he would forgive us, that he would uh, pick us up, dust us down, uh, and love us as his children. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. He is never far. So let's pray. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Well, may the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins. May he heal us and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I now hand over to John, who's going to read from the book of Nehemiah, and then Ian, who's going to continue our series through this book. Good morning. Uh, before John reads the passage, uh, let me briefly outline where we are in the, the Bible storyline, the history of God's revelation of his plan of salvation for his people. I'd like to use a diagram to walk you through the, uh, the Bible timeline and then highlight where we are in the book of Nehemiah. I'm hoping that this will help us to put the situation which Nehemiah is facing into context and uh, that should also help us to see what's at stake uh, in this in this. Bible passage. So let me uh, walk you through the timeline. At the beginning of Genesis we read about creation, the Garden of Eden, that God made all things and that they were good. However, in chapter 3 of Genesis it all begins to go wrong. As Adam and Eve sin, the fall takes place and they're ejected from the Garden of Eden. Even as the Lord God is pronouncing his judgment on Adam and Eve, there's a glimmer of hope as he announces that Adam's seed shall crush the serpent's head and the serpent shall strike his heel. Who is this serpent crusher? When will all this take place? The hunt is on. From this initial glimmer of hope, things begin to develop. Early on are the promises to Abraham. Then the people of Israel move to Egypt and live there for many years eventually becoming enslaved by the Egyptians. Moses leads them out in the Exodus as they're freed from their oppression. God gives them the law at Mount Sinai and leads them to the Promised Land. On their second attempt, they get to enter the land and take possession. God raises up King David as a great king over his people and things are looking up. His son Solomon builds the temple and things then seem to be on track. Will the people of Israel be restored? Will, is the serpent crush up one of Israel's kings? 
Sadly, the reality is that disaster strikes and there's a massive decline in Israel's fortunes. This leads to the exile when Nebuchadnezzar crushes uh, Jerusalem, takes its people captive and uh, exiles them to Babylon. In the time of King Cyrus, uh, he arranges for the Israelites to return. But the city of Jerusalem is in ruins. Its wall has been uh, broken down and gates have been burned. And the remnant of the people are in big trouble and disgrace. This is the point uh, which Nehemiah comes on the scene. So I think you can see it's not looking great. Uh, but this is a very interesting time to be reading this Bible passage as we look at this decline and how, how is God going to get things back on track. So there we are, but having got this far, let me finish the timeline so you know where we are in this overall picture. Shortly after Nehemiah, there's a long period of silence as few prophets are sent from God, and it all goes very quiet. From about 455 BC, for about 450 years, there's not a lot heard from the prophets. And this period is often called between the Testaments. Then suddenly, we have the birth of Jesus, and things are looking back on track. His ministry is recorded in the Gospels, along with his crucifixion and his resurrection. The risen Jesus meets with his disciples and tells them to wait for the coming Holy Spirit, and he ascends to heaven in their sight. Next, we've got the day of Pentecost, and God's Holy Spirit is poured out on the disciples in a miraculous way, with the reversal of the curse of Babel and the beginning of a period of explosive gospel witness and growth, which we read about in Acts. The apostles write the epistles around this time, and the church begins to grow, and that's where we are at the moment. Today, we're looking forward to the second coming of the Lord Jesus, when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. He will then usher in the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, all of which is written about in the book of Revelation. So there you have it, a rather condensed Bible overview in a few minutes. I think it's useful to know where we are in the Bible timeline so that we can ensure we understand the context of the book of Nehemiah. Now let me now hand over to John to read today's passage for us. Good morning. Today's reading is taken from Nehemiah chapter 2 verses 11 to 20. Nehemiah inspects Jerusalem's walls. I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went out through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on towards the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for, for my mind to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews, or the priests, or nobles, or officials, or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me, and what the king had said to me. They replied, Let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Jeshem the Arab heard about it. They mocked and ridiculed us. What is this there you are doing? they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, The God of heaven will give us success. We his servants will start rebuilding. But as for you, 
you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thank you, John, for reading. Uh, if you've got a Bible to hand, it would be helpful to have it open at uh, Nehemiah chapters 2 and 3, as I plan to refer to the passage during the talk. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you care for your people and that you graciously restore those who confess their sins and call on your name. Thank you that you rebuild and restore according to your good purposes. Build us into your kingdom here in Southbourne and across our land, we pray. Unite us in you, despite our diversity, and enable us to be salt and light wherever you have called us. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, the title of this morning's talk is Teamwork. Uh, this is the second talk in our a new series in the book of Nehemiah, Look, and uh, today I'm going to be looking at chapter 2, uh, verse 10, through to the end of chapter 3. Um, you recall that Matt spoke last week about chapter 1 of Nehemiah and the dire situation of God's people. Jerusalem is in ruins, the city wall has been breached, there's rubble everywhere, and God's people are in trouble and serious disgrace. On our Bible outline, they're near the bottom of that long downslope, and it's looking like the people of God, the Israelites, may not survive. They may not make it. If they don't survive, who will be the serpent crusher? How will God's promises to Abraham be fulfilled? How will the promised blessing to all peoples be possible? The book of Nehemiah is more than just a building project, more than just an archaeological restoration of interesting ruins. It's about how God retrieves his people from their disgrace and our trouble and gently restores a remnant so that his promises can still be fulfilled. It's not just a building project. It's about the delivery of God's promised blessing to his people and indeed all people through the seed of Abraham. Uh, briefly touching on the beginning of Nehemiah chapter 2, you'll read that Nehemiah approached King Artaxerxes and asked him for leave to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and its walls. He had carefully thought out his approach and asked the king for safe passage uh, to the area and the materials that he'd need to undertake the rebuilding. God was with Nehemiah and he granted him favour with King Artaxerxes, so his requests were granted. In God's sovereign power, in his grace and his mercy, he uses his faithful servant Nehemiah to demonstrate his grace and mercy to his people. While the people have fallen seriously short, as Matt outlined for us from last week's passage, this will in no way derail God's plan to pour out his mercy on his people, to purge their disgrace and retrieve them from the serious trouble that they're in. So I've got three main points today, all linked to how Nehemiah will tackle the rebuilding of Jerusalem, and here they are. Nehemiah's approach to the situation required, firstly, careful planning, motivation, and encouragement. Secondly, a diverse team. And thirdly, cooperation and coordination amongst the team. So let's look at each one of those in turn. Firstly, let's look at careful planning, motivation and encouragement. In today's passage, we read that Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem and within days he undertakes a reconnaissance of the city walls under cover of darkness and accompanied only by a few trusted companions. He needs to see the damage for himself and assess it. This is all part of his careful planning to restore God's people and their city. We also saw his careful planning in his requests to Artaxerxes earlier in chapter 2. And we see it in his careful survey of the city in our passage today. Part of this planning involves thinking about motivating and actually doing the motivating of the Israelites in Jerusalem to take action. As a newcomer, Nehemiah is able to point out the true situation of the people and invite them to deal with it. In verse 17 of chapter 2, we see Nehemiah's succinct statement 
of the situation. As well as presenting the problem clearly, he presents the solution. He invites them to all work together with him to rebuild the wall so as to remove the disgrace from God's people. The first encouragement to them is through sharing that God has given him favour by allowing him to come to Jerusalem and to bring the scarce resources which will be needed to do the rebuilding. The second encouragement is that he has the backing of King Artaxerxes through his statements. Nehemiah is successful in his approach to the people. This is a massive project which will require lots of hard labour and the participation of everyone in Jerusalem. You can imagine that some uh, may have wanted to avoid the effort or to distance themselves from this expensive endeavour. In the event, God gave Nehemiah favour in the eyes of his people and he was successful in calling on them to do the work. His careful planning, motivation and encouragement were honoured by God and led to the rebuilding and the restoration. So that's the first point. The second point is the need for a diverse team. Clearly, Nehemiah is not going to be able to do all of this work by himself. This job is not going to be achievable without the work of all the people in Israel, all those living in Jerusalem, and also many of the Israelites living in the surrounding towns as well. Please take a look at chapter 3, and you'll see that the team which was assembled was large and very diverse. The chapter mentions 25 different individuals and 14 different groups of people. Some of the names are a bit challenging, so I spare John reading them all out, but please read them separately if you have a, a, a minute. Um, the people mentioned are priests, Residents of Jericho, that's to the northeast of Jerusalem, men of Tekoa to the south, men of Gibeon and Mizpah to the north, goldsmiths, perfume makers, rulers of districts, and the daughters of one of the rulers, more goldsmiths, Levites, temple servants, etc., etc. This is a very diverse group of people. I'm not sure how they did it, but the perfume makers and goldsmiths turned into brickies, stonemasons, and labourers. Without all the hard work and talents of these people, the job would have been impossible. And yet the work began, and all, with the notable exception of the nobles of Tekoa in verse 5, were willing and able to help. This was certainly a diverse team, seeking to honour the Lord God and remove the disgrace of his people by their hard work and perseverance. So that's the second point. Uh, that was a diverse team seeking to honour the Lord God. Now my third point is the need for cooperation and coordination. Let me illustrate this by doing a visual walk around the walls of Jerusalem and I'm going to be following the narrative in chapter 3 using a diagram. Here we go. Well, here's a brief schematic map of Jerusalem, which um, describes and shows uh, the wall, the construction of the wall that uh, Nehemiah refers to in chapter 3. So let's get going. First up is the Sheep Gate. That's at the northeast corner of uh, the old city of Jerusalem. It's mentioned in verse 1. And uh, that is then followed by a construction of a stretch of wall from the Sheep Gate through to uh, with including a couple of towers, the Towers of Hundred and Tower of Hananel. Uh, and then that leads to the Fish Gate uh, further to the west and verse mentioned in verse 3. And another stretch of wall leading to uh, the Jeshana Gate in, mentioned in verse 6. Uh, that's followed by a wall heading south, the big broad wall mentioned in verse 8 and then another stretch of wall leading to a tower, the Tower of the Ovens, mentioned in verse 11. Uh, further wall construction to the south leads through to the Valley Gate. This is the gate where um, uh, Nehemiah first uh, went to as he was doing his initial inspection of the wall before the construction work got going. So Valley Gate mentioned in, in verse 13, and then a further stretch of wall heading right down to the south leading to the Dung Gate, which is mentioned also in verse 13. A further length of wall heading back north at this point through to the fountain gate 
And at this point, there's mention of three features, the pool of Siloam in verse 15, David's tomb in verse 16, and the armory in verse 19. So those are all mentioned, those are all inside the city wall. And here you'll see the next length of wall from the fountain gate heading north is, is constructed. And then there's a tower mentioned in verse 25, and then the water gate mentioned in verse 26. Carrying on north, we've got another length of wall, uh, another tower mentioned also in verse 26, and then a large tower mentioned in verse 27. Continuing north, you have a long stretch of wall which the Levites were looking after, leading up to the horse gate, further wall going north leading up to the east gate, and yet more length of wall going north heading up to the inspection gate mentioned in verse 31, and that's topped off by the final two stretches of wall here returning back to the sheep gate. And there you have it, the whole length of the wall around the old city of Jerusalem uh, rebuilt and uh, done so in a very efficient manner by Nehemiah the builder and with the huge cooperation of uh, the, the various people involved from cities around Jerusalem and also from Jerusalem itself. That, that's the end of the schematic. All of this must have been a massive effort to accomplish. All these sections of wall and gates had to be closely coordinated. There would be no point in building a section of the wall which didn't run from and to the right parts of the city. The potential for different building techniques, walls which didn't support each other, weak points in the structure, etc., must have been huge. All the more need for careful coordination and cooperation between the teams of builders as they went about the work. So that's the third point, the need for cooperation and coordination. Of course, it, it wasn't all plain sailing. There were enemies and opponents, most notably Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, official, and Geshem the Arab. These individuals were important local and national leaders, well connected with the authorities and influential. Their opposition would have been a serious obstacle more about this next week from Mike. But Nehemiah was firm and clear in his rebuttal of their opposition. He was convinced that God would give the Israelites success, and he rejected any claims which these outsiders might have on Jerusalem either at that time or in the past. Okay, so so much for Nehemiah and the passage then. It's now time for us to consider how the lessons which Nehemiah shares with us, apply to us today. The people of God in Nehemiah's day were under pressure, concerned about survival, and keen to ensure that God's promises would be fulfilled. That has quite a contemporary ring for us today, doesn't it? Many have pronounced the death of the church through declining numbers and ageing congregations. Many have suggested that we live in a post-Christian era where science has disproved God and we no longer need the crutch of religion to support us. Christian belief and practice are under attack in our courts, in society, in our schools, universities, in local councils, and indeed in central government. So we would do well to listen hard to Nehemiah, learn from his example and be encouraged by him as we deal with these issues today. So here are my questions for you to ponder, and home groups will have a chance to chew these over in, in, in greater depth. Uh, do join a home group if you aren't a member already. So here are the questions. As God's redeemed people here today, how well do we plan our activities and also motivate and encourage God's people today? Second question. How diverse is our team? And how do we show, express our unity, our solidarity and our commitment? Third question. How well do we cooperate to achieve the Lord's purposes and objectives? Do we coordinate well between ourselves so that our efforts are worthwhile and have maximum impact for the Lord?
tough questions, and there are no easy answers to those questions. Your answer will depend on your level of engagement, the activities you're involved in, and your responsibilities. Please do think through your answers and come away with one or two or maybe three things which you'd like to do a bit better or improve on. Even better than this, please discuss these questions with a fellow church member in your home group and or perhaps, uh, sorry, fellow church member or in your home group and take time to encourage one another as well as pray for the Lord's guidance as to how to serve him and each other more effectively. The God of heaven who worked through Nehemiah and the people of Israel then, he's the same God today. He wants to continue working out his purposes through us and through his church today. Are we ready to plan, motivate and encourage one another? Are we ready to work together as a diverse team for God's glory? Are we coordinating and cooperating to the best of our God-given abilities to achieve his purposes and to honour him? Here are a few suggestions I'd like to offer for areas of potential improvement. Uh, note that I very much include myself in all of these suggestions. So how can we do better? Firstly, take ownership. Our church is all of us together, not just the wardens, the PCC, or those keen participants. Uh, I think you've often heard it said, or you may not be aware, but 80% of the work in most churches is done by 20% of the people, uh, which is not a bad thing sometimes, but we are all the church. It's time to contribute. It's time not just to look in from the outside, it's time to knuckle down and take ownership. Second idea of things that we can do better. Seriously consider finding a suitable area where you can contribute and offer to help. Now this can be lots of different areas, all sorts of areas. Physical work, doing things around the building, uh, if and as and when we get back to services, that kind of thing. Could be giving, giving money. You may have some money that you can give to support God's work at Southbourne and beyond. It may be caring for others and encouraging them. It may be prayer, and that is a real, true, hard work, prayer for the work of the Lord at our church. So that's the second thing we can do better. Third thing we might be able to do better is to think about your participation, your and my participation. How could we get more involved with what goes on? Fourth suggestion is Consider how we could coordinate well with others. Go out of our way to cooperate with fellow church members, working together as the body of Christ, to demonstrate his love in thought, in word, and in deed. And the fifth and final uh, thought as to what we might be able to do better is to actively to look for, for fellow church members who could use a break or who need support and encouragement. Perhaps we could offer to help them, tell them how much we appreciate what they do and where appropriate, work alongside them to accomplish the Lord's purposes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that your gospel is the power that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Thank you for calling each one of us to be your people here at St. John's and in all the places where you're sending us. Show us how to be your faithful people through careful planning, through motivation and encouragement as well, we pray. Help us to make good use of all the various talents and skills which you've given us and show us how to include each member as we seek to do those good works which you have prepared in advance for each one of us to do. Show us how we can and should cooperate well and coordinate effectively so that we can accomplish your purposes and bring honour and glory to your name. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Saviour, 
Jesus Christ. Amen. But thank you very much, Ian. I think there's plenty of food for thought there and small groups will be following up the work uh, to, so we can explore it and discuss it uh, in more depth. And if you're not in a small group, do remember that you can still uh, just ask us for the notes so you can study it by yourself or, or whoever you share your home with uh, just, to, just to sort of keep us developing that thought. Let it not go cold. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Tim, who's going to lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we come to you with our anxieties and hopes for ourselves and for those for whom we care. Like Nehemiah, we are distressed about our country, our families and friends. And like him, we seek opportunities to make changes. As we bring our prayers to you, Show us what you would have us do. Guide us in how we are to do it. And may we have the opportunity to give you the glory for what is achieved. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your church, confessing our lack of unity, concentrating on what makes us distinctive rather than the truths that we share. We want to follow Jesus, his way, your way. Guide the new synod, our bishops, Matt and our church, that we may follow you more closely day by day. We are conscious that there will be factions, their anger reflecting their fear just in Nehemiah's time. Give us the capacity to love them as you do even if we do not share their point of view. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up to you in prayer political leaders and community leaders, our government and the district and parish councillors. Jesus set the example for servant leadership and in his name, we pray against any leadership that is self-serving or which scapegoats parts of their community. We pray that you will support leaders who feel vulnerable when they follow you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our families and friends. In a moment of silence, can we each lift up to you those for whom we have a concern, particularly as a result of this present lockdown? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mindful of their senses of grief and fear, we commend to your care those known to us who are sick or who have lost loved ones. Again, in a moment of quiet, let us name them to God, that he may minister to them, bringing healing and comfort. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We rejoice in our fellowship with one another and with all other believers and commend ourselves to your unfailing love. And to that end, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 
Thank you very much, Tim. And it's really good, isn't it? The Lord's Prayer in particular is that pattern that reminds us, as Nehemiah prayed at the beginning, uh, that he wanted to have God, God's perspective on things. Your will be done, your kingdom come. Those are really important words uh, and, and it's important to keep those together. We're going to close our, our time together now. Do join us uh, later at 11.15 for coffee virtually on Zoom. Uh, it'd be great to see you catch up. Uh, and Mike and his uh, team have prepared the Lord's My Shepherd. Let's uh, close, shall we, with the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. I'll see you soon. Stay safe.